right, so I'd just like to welcome everyone to our latest, um, MWCC's latest lunchtime conservation conversation. Um, today we're here with Karen Boyd, who has so graciously um, agreed to join us to start a conversation about geomorphology. And Karen, who I'm sure most of you know, um, she's the fluvial geomorphologist with applied geomorphology in Bozeman. Um, she just has a, you know, a lot of experience, a wealth of experience on this. And also um, I found out, you know, she's basically gonna be sharing with us some of the conversations that she's been having um, with her fellow geomorphologists. And um, yeah, it should be really interesting. Um, and I'll, I'll reiterate this at the end too, but you know, these are meant to be casual. They're also meant to be learning, not just from Karen, but learning from one another. I know there are a lot of people in this room who also have experience in this area um, for good, bad, indifferent um, tips, things to share. And so just wanna encourage you after Karen's presentation um, to certainly ask questions and ask questions of Karen, but also to ask questions of one another um, and to offer up any um, ideas or experiences that you've had in this area as well. And um, also, uh, I know there's just a few others who've joined us recently, but just a reminder, you can put your um, name and organization in the chat um, so we all know, know who's here. And with that, I will pass it off to Karen. Okay, um, thank you, Terry. I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, and Karen, you might wanna, can you adjust the angle of your, it's kind of just showing the top of your head. Okay, yeah, hang on. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. Um, so when I first talked to Terry, you know, this, this whole conversation, I remember the term was fluvial flops, you know, and what sort of things have we, perhaps not done as well, uh, uh, how can we learn from our mistakes, right, in this field? And I was a little bit hesitant because I didn't want to just start slamming projects and describe how bank treatments failed and now they were poorly designed because there's always so much more nuance with those sorts of things. However, there are some things that have sort of eaten at me over the years that I kind of want to get into. And I really don't want to come across as being either cynical or uh, Pollyannish about the real life things that we're all trying to do making a living, but I do also just want to go through some things that are examples really just to stimulate conversation. I'm curious to see what you guys might um, have to, to in, in response to some of these things. So we're going to be talking about geomorphology and, and restoration and some discussions that are generally going on out there in, in the world of the colleagues that I work with. And one thing we talk about and we have been talking about is fundamentally the Hippocratic Oath and in terms of how you approach rivers, right? First, do no harm. And so I looked it up and this was a, this was a translation from Latin that basically says, I'll apply for the benefit of the sick, meaning an ailing stream system, all the measures which are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. And we all know what overtreatment is, it certainly happens. Therapeutic nihilism is the presumption that all illnesses in the body can be cured by the body itself. And that certainly is the case, right, in stream systems. So we're, we're walking a fine line here between overtreatment and undertreatment. And the way that I think we navigate that is to really understand how these systems uh, behave and providing context with that. So one thing that we talk about is, man, the, the whole method or the whole rampant thing of this is my method, my method has really in many cases made people come in with, with their approach and they apply the approach and sometimes the approach can be misapplied or it's, it's the wrong approach to begin with. And so, of course, the risk of that is that we go in and we think we really know how these systems should be behaving. So we build that and it doesn't behave. And then we basically come back and do our monitoring and and uh, maintain these systems to behave as we, we believe they should, when in some cases that's not the case at all and you're just pushing water uphill. This is one example. Um, this was a project that was done down on the Yampa River that was several years ago I was asked to review. And it was an assessment of the Yampa ways down below Steamboat Springs in Colorado. And an approach was taken, the reference reach approach to try and figure out if this stream was stable and if not, what you should do about it. And basically the approach was to take two references. Can you see my, um, my 
cursor there, my arrow? Um, yes, yes, we okay. can. Okay, thank you. So the upper Yampa and the North Platte were chosen for these two reference streams. And so basically the presumption was that the geomorphic potential of the project reach could be described by the reference reach parameters listed in the table below. And that's, here's all these different parameters of slope and shape and width and size, all those things. Uh, layout, wavelength, uh, meander width ratios, you know, all these various things that they had ranges for. And then they took every reach of the Yampa and tried to see if it fit those ranges. And lo and behold, it didn't fit very well, right? And the next slide shows only four out of 15 parameters met those ranges. And the conclusion was the Yampa is messed up and we got to fix it because it does not meet our reference reach criteria. And so what happened, and I just couldn't believe this. I was, I kind of, it was rough. Um, the recommendations, it was nine miles a channel. And for every single reach, uh, the first eight reaches, the recommendation was to completely rebuild the Yampa River to the tune of $10 million because it did not fit the parameters of those reference reaches. And this, this was a, this is a bona fide, um, group that did this work. And every time you went through, you would see different alternatives considered, no action, all the things you would consider, moving diversions. The main problem was diversion structures. Um, smaller smaller uh, approaches, more incremental approaches, but ultimately the recommended alternative was to completely rebuild the river and bring in all sorts of uh, treatments you can see on the lower left and basically create the Yampa River that they wanted to have. Ultimately though, when we looked at it, what was what ended up this whole thing was abandoned, tens of thousand dollars worth of work and assessment and alternatives development. Because when you started looking at it, there were things going on there that just the reference reaches didn't apply, right? It, uh, the whole upper route county there, tremendous amount of historic mining, there was sediment loading. It was a response reach at the mouth of the canyon. There were there were problems with irrigation dams and push up dams that they were um, diverting water that you could deal with very differently. And ultimately this was uh, the Nature Conservancy as a big preserve down there. And they were distraught because they had incredible riparian health. This is a shot showing rip riparian succession on a point bar in the project reach. And they were really concerned that this whole valley bottom was gonna be shredded and the, and the channel rebuilt. So the the project, hope, fortunately, the people looking at it said, well, we don't know. It just doesn't look that bad. It just looks like the Yampa. And um, so it was basically intercepted and the work was done on much more of a micro scale to work with irrigators. But that's an example where it just came in strong with a method. And once they were committed, they just couldn't pull away from it. This is something that's a little bit different with context. This is um, Grayling Creek down by West Yellowstone. This is Highway 287 going from the Gallatin Canyon Road up here down to Quake Lake along Hebgen Lake. And Grayling Creek comes out of the mountains and forms under this big delta where it comes into Hebgen. And you can see where it crosses the highway. They, they had to squeeze it down to get it through the highway, but there was this old, really beautiful delta, pretty important cutthroat stream. And the problem, uh, the Forest Service was really concerned about this section in here above the highway. And basically what had happened was, if you look up at the top here in the 50s, you had this really dense riparian, small channels, flow all over, really good habitat. And then with time, um, going down here, this is the same section of river coming up to the mid 2000s, you can see this whole thing just blew up. And lost a lot of really good habitat value, a lot of riparian area. And the, and the basic presumption at the beginning was that the ownership of this ranch, there had been bad grazing practices, there had been irrigation water mismanagement and manual messing around with these channels and consolidating the flow. The landowner said, we didn't do any of that, but we haven't owned the ranch for that long, but maybe the previous landowner had done that. So this, this photo here on the right is what it looks like now with it's graded and there's a bunch of gravel bars. And this is just up on the floodplain, these old channels that you thought, man, if we can just get water back into them, the pools are still there, there's beautiful habitat. Uh, that's probably what we should be doing and put this thing back on track. Well, 
when you start really diving into the broader picture here, what really became clear was that the previous ranch was called the Blarney Stone Ranch. And in 1959, a USGS group was camped at the head of the creek. And there's all these really good USGS records of the quotes that these guys had when the, when the um, Hebgen Lake earthquake happened in 1959, it was in late August, it was a full moon, it happened at midnight, it must have been really surreal. And these guys were camped in a trailer and he just said, when I got outside, the trailer was in place, but the trees were whipping back and forth, the leaves were rustling as if moved by a strong wind, but there was no wind. I knew right then it was an earthquake. I could hear avalanches in the canyon, see huge clouds of dust billow out of the canyons. I drove towards the ranch and about a quarter mile down, I came across a fault scarp. And there was a, this is the fault scarp under the barn at the Blarney Stone Ranch. It was 14 feet high. And uh, it crossed right across Grayling Creek where it came out of the mountains. And nobody had put this together. Nobody, everybody said, hi, I wonder what the earthquake might've done. And when you start digging around, it was very clear that there was an event that happened out here that was way different than the premise that had been laid out that had to be totally taken into consideration for moving, basically taking what you have on Grayling Creek and moving forward. The other thing was that the whole valley tilted. This, um, the whole valley bottom tilted six feet to the Northwest. So even topographically, this was before we had any LIDAR or anything, but um, they went out and surveyed it. And so it was basically a game changer for your restoration strategy. So the thing that we're kind of talking about now for a method, and this is from a guy down in Colorado, he just calls it heads up geomorphology, which is, and this was at River Restoration Northwest this year, which is we really need to be integrating science and history and people and observation. And we need to allow ourselves time to just kind of get our arms wrapped around things before we move forward and really move uh, work with nature instead of against it by imparting our will on these stream systems. One thing about history I wanted to point out in Montana, this is kind of interesting, the, the long-term hydrologic context I think is really important. And this is the mussel shell in central Montana. And they always, you know, they always quote the severe drought of 88, the river dried up below Roundup, and that was not uncommon. But really it was much broader than that. Many of our stream systems in Montana from the early 80s to 2000, we're in a very low flow period. The severe drought was about 2000 to 2010, but you see it in the rivers that they contracted, they atrophied. You would go out there and measure bank full discharge in 1979 here on the left, and it would probably be you know 60% of what it would be there in 2009. So these systems are responding to these longer term trends. And so the muscle shell you can see on the right here, and 2009, the Russian olive came in super strongly. And so we had this period of contraction and then we had a big flood and the river essentially just blew up and the width of it tripled. And so it's a really important, the, the, the locals had forgotten, it was, it was the grandparents who remembered the rivers of the fifties. Everybody out there, they were like, man, we, we didn't even think of it. It just sort of seemed like a ditch. And now all of a sudden it's a river again. So part of that, again, was that time frame of low flows and changing of our rivers. We see it on the Sun River. We saw it on the Clark Fork that the 80s through the early 2000s all across Montana. And then 2011 was a huge year. And many of our stream systems kind of woke up and were like, well, they're unstable. Well, they really weren't. They were responding to this event. Another thing we talk about, I just want to throw out as a concept is looking at three main things. One is stressors. One, are, one is what's the external influences on these systems that we need to think about relieving? It could be climate. It could be that someone channelized it. It could be, this is for a project I worked on where it was flow augmentation. So the stressors were all this water was being introduced that destabilized the channel. Okay, so we've got those pressures on the system and then we want to increase the resilience that can withstand those pressures. And then we can think about what we might do to ba basically help the system absorb whatever stressors it's seeing. And then we can start talking about restoring habitats. Once we, once we start taking the heat off of the system and we start adding its resilience to that heat, then we can start really doing the fun stuff, which is you know, the wetland work and the fish habitat work, et cetera. So then we can take strategies 
to get there and then define our, our um, optimal outcomes. So that's kind of the way I think about stuff now is how can we deal with the stressors, increase the ability of the system to absorb and withstand those stressors. And then on top of that, really bump up the ecological function. Another thing we talk about is the natural tra trajectory. You know, systems will destabilize and then with time, they will actually self heal in many cases. And so where you are really matters. This is called the incised channel evolution model where you start with a typical kind of multi-thread, probably beavery connected wet valley bottom. And then many of our systems down cut and became detached from their floodplain, whether it was land use or messing with the channel, channelizing systems, uh, focusing all the flow for irrigation into one channel, they would down cut. And then they, once they down cut, they'll start widening out and then create an inset floodplain and then continue to recover till you might get back to that, his, that old setting um, situation where you have a good floodplain, a good riparian corridor. This one's at a lower elevation, but it's still providing a lot of the ecological functions that you started with. So we always talk about how broken is it? Because that matters in terms of where you wanna go. And we even talk about what time is it on this thing? Or if we're at three o'clock, we're in trouble. We really need to get in there and try and arrest that down cutting before we can do anything else. If we're here, we might wanna just let it be and let it recover on its own. So kind of, and then where you are depends on what you do because ideally you're gonna piggyback that natural trajectory. That's what we always say. What is the trajectory of this if we don't do anything? And if it's in a healing mode, how do we just speed it up? So here's an example. Um, this is Muddy Creek, a uh, tributary that enters the Sun River up in by Vaughn near Great Falls. And it's really broken. This is 1936. It had already started to incise with irrigation flows. This is the same creek in 1970, down cut up to 30 feet and just completely, it was down cutting into uh, old glacial lake Great Falls deposits, really fine silts. And so it just melted. Biggest non-point pollution problem in the state of Montana in the 80s, all the sediment. And so this was because the flows went up uh, probably, the bankful flow probably four or five times because of transbasin irrigation water irrigating the uh, Greenfield's bench outside of Fairfield was all the return flows were entering this tiny creek. So it blew up. So this is what it looks like today. We just flew a drone and the grade controls were put into whole grade. And so what you can look at is reducing the stressors, continuing to deal with the flow. We need to secure the re resilience and we need to hold the floor on this thing. And then we can start pushing the recovery trajectory. We're looking at reactivating meanders, fixing up the banks, doing all kinds of things that um, can only be built when you get that foundation stuff done and also work on those stressors. Clark Fork River, this is over by Deer Lodge. It's sort of pretty broken, you know, but the, the stressors were legacy stressors. This was from mining in Butte that they had big floods and there were huge amounts of tailings that came down and buried the Clark Fork floodplain in the Deer Lodge Valley, which made it a super fun site. And, but ultimately the stressors had pretty well been relieved. So we just had all these metals in the floodplain and a very high graded floodplain with no access. So really what we're doing here is just pushing that recovery trajectory and removing the metals. So what's, what's going on with the remedy is excavating all the metals and then rebuilding the floodplain at a much lower elevation. So we have, we can support a riparian corridor and have that inset, that floodplain surface. And then we get to the BDA world, you know, where, where you get into this sort of broken world where a lot of it's grazing, get a little bit of down cutting, the beaver been trapped out. And here you can really address land use stressors and probably truly restore it back to a historic condition, either through building things like BDAs here, building higher riffles that we promote aggradation and trying to reconnect these systems vertically. In many cases, the, you know, we never used to really get very excited about these, but these are probably the best bang for the pro projects that we can do out there because you can do very low tech, very inexpensive stuff and get a really good uh, response. But really very different levels of how bad is it and where are you in the in the trajectory. Thank you. Karen, it's 1220. It's 1220. Just so you know. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Minimal action alternative. You know, we need to think about that. This is riparian planting and grazing management. Um, no action alternative. These were quotes from landowners on the muscle shell 
after the 2011 flood. And these guys were amazing. I mean, they said, look at these, the river is tender right now. I mean, and these guys, their, their systems, their, their economies were hammered. And they said, we're just going portable. Everything's going to go portable. If a guy could outlast it, that's what we're after till it stabilizes. This one I love. The guys who did the best were the guys who did nothing. That was a couple of years after the Muscle Shell flood. And my dad told me, don't fight the river. Only a fool would fight the river. And I just, these guys, I loved talking with them. They were very wise. And here's a little bit about wisdom. I had the good fortune of being in Mongolia a few years ago. We were traveling with monks. And we were there on National Tree Planting Day in Erdenet, Mongolia, which is a town with a big copper mine with all these Russians there. And tree planting day was a big deal. Everyone would go out, here's the mayor being interviewed, and they would literally go to the same holes that had been there the year before and pull out the dead tree from last year and put a new tree in. And this is Kathy Zabinski from MSU, and she just kept saying, you need to appreciate the grasslands, you need to appreciate the steppe. And they were trying to reforest Mongolia to make it, and the monks, it was so funny, we were just walking around with these guys and they were just shaking their heads. And so we had these conversations, we ended up out on this monastery and we took walks and we talked about time and healing and learning and um, it was really quite wild. And so I'll just end with that and just say that, you know, here's to keep learning. And, and I know that we all, we're all trying to make a living and we're all trying to do best by the resource and there's there's balances with everything, but um, hopefully that, uh, yeah, just gives you a little sense of some of the stuff we're thinking about now. Mm. And those are Perslowski horses, by the way, the, some of the oldest horses, or the oldest horses. Cool. So with thanks. that, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for that, Karen. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks. But that was a, that was some great insights. I love that bringing it around to how sometimes we we make some of the same like mistakes. We do a little too much all over the world. It's not just a Montana problem. Um, <laughs> um, that's great. That's some great insight there from Mongolia. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna basically open it up to Q and A. And just a reminder that again, we're we're certainly here to learn from Karen's experience, but we're also here to learn from one another's experience and to really start a conversation. Um, so feel free to ask questions of the whole group and also to share any thoughts or experiences you might have had in this area in addition to asking any questions of Karen. Um, and if you wanna ask a question, um, feel free to just hop in and unmute. You can also ask questions in the chat or um, do the little raise hand if you know how to do that in the reactions. Any of those will work. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Oh, come on. I know, I know there are questions out there. <laughs> hey, Chuck, there's Chuck. Tell us about your experiences. I see you, Chuck. You're muted. There we go. Uh, which ones? <laughs> um, you know, I guess uh, my experience has largely been in Yellowstone River Basin and surrounding the uh, aftermath of the back-to-back uh, -back near 100-year floods. And one of the things I've found surprising, although that effort uh, could have concluded with, I think, a much better uh, set of recommendations, but one huge challenge was um, getting a very diverse group of highly opinionated people together and having them agree um, on anything. And doing that <clears throat> with John Bailey as a facilitator. Um, I don't know if any of you know John uh, of the, he's the son of Dan Bailey, you know, real famous fly fisherman shop in Livingston. Um, highly motivated, but not exactly a people person. So um, as we went through that effort, it really was, you know, herding wild horses. And as a consequence, uh, I think to the positive side, one thing we really did do was raise awareness of what our um, 
you know, rivers need to erode, some erosion problems, uh, you know, really are accelerated and can benefit from human intervention. But in most cases, as you know, Karen had uh, indicate, indicated, if you develop the patients in a longer term view, um, perhaps with a little encouragement, strategic encouragement here and there, natural systems will, uh, you know, will heal themselves. I could go on, but I'll let someone else speak. Well, Chuck, I would just say to that too, and I'm glad Jeff's here. Um, you know, we saw the two dot project last week and on, on the Clark Fork, the remedy, it's gotten some heat from the, the residents of Deer Lodge because when you go down there and you do that project, it looks like a bomb went off when you take out all those tailings and they're like, what happened to our river? And it's year seven now since the first phase was built up at Warm Springs and it is taking off. And there had to be a certain amount of trust for time for the temporal trajectory of any restoration project. And I'm sure, you know, the two dot project will be the same time thing. Sometimes you need to take a deep breath and step back. Yeah. And just allow time to do its thing, which is hard, which is hard. We'll pretty much want instant results. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, this is Jeff. Karen, you set me up. Uh... <laughs> yeah, two dot is is uh, you know it's going to take off. It's going to be good. Uh, you know, as society, we we don't have patience, uh, and that's why I don't think um, the consulting community and folks in general uh, bought into more vegetation in these projects. Didn't have the patience to wait for the vegetation to take hold. I know back in my permit days when I was doing this uh, statewide, um, that was one of the biggest problems. Uh, folks were in a hurry the bank's eroding, we got to fix it. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to rock it. Okay. Uh, the other big, one of the biggest impacts back in the day, and that, that's really improved, but one of the biggest impacts to our rivers and streams was, in my opinion, the consulting community. Um, well, who's going to fix it? What are we going to do? And how can we spend more money to fix something that may or may not even be broke? Uh, and that's, that, I guess the do nothing alternative is one of the hardest or do very little alternative is one of the hardest cases to make when you're out there in the trenches and somebody wants to do something. So that's, that's just my perspective on it. it it's a tough world out there in the trenches. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I agree entirely. Yeah, those are some really good insights. And, and I, I, I do have a question myself. I'm curious, you know, I, I've seen some projects where a major concern might be a bridge that's going to wash out or somebody's irrigation ditch is going to, you know, what, what do you advise in those kind of cases where it's like, yeah, we recognize that this is not just about like, you know, we can't just let the river take its course. There might be some key infrastructure. How do you, how do you approach that? Oh, for sure. No, it's a choose your battles thing. Identify critical infrastructure, anything like that, we don't, you don't mess around. If, if you have to, um, if you have to go into certain places and use full bank armor to protect a bridge, it's probably the best way to go. And so, yeah, it's, it's all about identifying that um, kind of flow chart in terms of what are you protecting? And we've run numbers, you know, somebody has a pivot and they're losing ground, you can run the numbers with them on the cost of putting in armor versus removing, shortening their pivot swing. And it might take them 50 years to generate the grain to pay for the rock to protect that ground. And so some of it can be numbers driven, but um, in terms of land use, but certainly critical infrastructure is something you don't mess around with and get after. Hey, Karen, it's Jeff again. No, you're right on. I, I used to be a, a big time anti-rock person. And the realization that when you've got critical infrastructure, yeah, you got to protect it. And what is the lowest risk? Well, it's usually a good, good rock project. Uh, the only thing I would add is when and if that is the case, we have always tried to suggest to put a little lipstick on the pig, try to get some vegetation, probably willow in those voids of that rock 
and do that. But short of that, nah, go ahead and protect the infrastructure. But you make a good point too, the cost benefit analysis has to be applied a lot more often. Maybe that undersized bridge that you're attempting to protect uh, is gonna spend a lot, a lot of money on, maybe the best alternative is to look at maybe a new bridge, a lot more money, but for the long-term, a better fix. So look at the long picture, look into the future. We don't oftentimes do that, unfortunately. Well, and I'd say with that too, Jeff, one thing that like the Yampa was a good example, we're really pushing people to consolidate infrastructure. So if you have a bridge and you have five irrigation diversions on the Yampa, we are trying to consolidate those diversions and actually put them up, put it up by the bridge. So you got a bridge as a fixed point in your channel migration zone. That's probably one of the best places right below where you can divert water and put everybody on that system. And it takes you know, a certain amount of finagling and agreement to make that happen, but consolidating infrastructure is always something to think about too. I'm curious if anybody else out there has an example of when they've kind of had to make one of these tough choices, you know, with infrastructure versus trying to, trying to help out a stream or a river. Does anybody else have any examples? Yeah, it looks like Rat Radley. Hi, um, oh. we have one that we're working on right now where there's um, a stream restoration project right below a bridge. The bridge is a private bridge for a driveway and the river's coming right down and turns 90 degrees at the bridge, you know, to go through the bridge and then um, runs along the highway. And really what we need to do is relocate that bridge farther away from the highway and in line with what the new restoration will be underneath it. However, it's really hard to come up with funding to relocate a private bridge. Um, so it, it's kind of crazy that, you know, we're talking about spending some significant funds to make the river more resilient beneath and um, we have this big problem just upstream. I mean, right at the beginning of the project. And I, I'm not quite sure what to do there. I don't even know if it's gonna happen and there's already been a substantial amount of grant funding obtained to do this project. But um, yeah, so sometimes the infrastructure, that little keyhole can be a big problem. I, I also had a question, just if anybody's run into issues with BDAs and, um, floodplain ordinances or anything like that. You know, if we have a mapped floodplain, then we're not supposed to be sticking BDAs in there because anything that's in the mapped floodplain is supposed to last through the hundred year flood. And, you know, man-made BDA doesn't do that. So you gotta be a little careful about what you stick in a mapped floodplain. Um, I'll chime in. I, I don't, it's funny, you know, when you do a project now, it's like, are we in a map floodplain? And then when someone says no, you're like, oh, thank God. It's, it's uh, because you might spend 40 grand on a no rise analysis for, well, and, and I think Jeff and some folks in Helena have been working very hard on this, but I have not. I don't know. Every, everywhere I have has been unmapped for those treatments. Hey, it's Jeff. Um... Yeah, that's why I look like I'm as old as I am. We've been fighting this floodplain issue for a hell of a long time. <laughs> and you know, it, I, I have nothing against floodplain regulation when we regulate um, large structures, um, developments in a floodplain, you betcha. The more the merrier, the harder they get the permit, the better. But we're talking about projects not getting accomplished, restoration projects. Um, your, your beaver mimicry stuff. If it's a map floodplain, you're going to have a no rise analysis. 10, 12, $20,000 later, you may or may not have a permit because, um, because it's in a map floodplain area. So yeah, we've been fighting it. Now, are we making progress? Sort of maybe. Some of you may remember that last legislative session, we got a resolution 
SJR 6 through the legislature, uh, in essence, identifying the problem and uh, asking uh, FEMA to work with us on these issues. Uh, it was like pulling teeth uh, to get it moving. The minute we got the resolution through the legislature, FEMA really quieted down. We couldn't even get anybody to work with us. Uh, just a month or two ago through our congressional delegation, Senator Tester's office, uh, we did get um, an acknowledgement from FEMA to start working with us. And next week, we will have our first phone call with uh, the Region 8 um, floodplain management person, a guy by the name of Harry Katz. We'll just start out. Uh, will we make any real progress? The reality is probably until we get to a point where we can change the regulation, uh, there's not a lot we can do. It's, it's set in concrete. Uh, there's not a lot of wiggle room or interpretation in that floodplain regulation. But there is a chance FEMA has come under attack by uh, folks uh, lawsuits and such that are not in compliance with Endangered Species Act. Uh, we've been working on that. And as a result, FEMA may have to enter into a change of this regulation, which something they haven't even considered for 45 years. So folks, anybody who's having problems with us, get back to us in, in, in Helena here, get on this committee. We're working on these issues and help us Time is, is perfect right now if we're ever going to get a change in that regulation. So anybody on this call, keep that in mind and get the word out. Now is now is the right time to work on it. You well, guys got your, going. <laughs> thanks for your hard work. And I think you look really good for 29. <laughs> <laughs> Just high mileage. <laughs> Jeff, I was gonna say I'll um, you know, after this call, I'll send out um, a few things to everybody, you know, within a couple of days of this, like the links to the recording and, and everything. And um, I have been, we ask everybody if it's okay to share their email addresses and anybody who said yes, including you, I think. Um, so maybe would it be appropriate to tell people to reach out to you if they are interested in giving feedback or joining that committee? Absolutely. Okay. I will include that then. Thanks. Any other questions, everybody? I was curious, Karen, you asked, um, you were mentioning, oh, oh, where, well, we've got one question about where you can find floodplain maps. The, the FEMA maps you can get on the FEMA website. They have a pretty good interactive server. I don't know if anybody has any other places to go. That's where I go. Got it. Um, and my question yeah. was, oh. Oh, I was gonna add in, I think uh, DNRC Water Resources Division in their floodplain section, uh, you know, also has that information probably you know, and also linking back to FEMA. Um, but I think I might start there first. And some county GIS systems have that just mapped in there too, as a layer. Oh, I was like forgetting my question, but um, Garrett, I was going to ask you, you know, you mentioning, um, you know, you've been having conversations with, with people in this field. I don't, I don't know if that's across Montana or, or across the nation. Are there any states that are kind of doing things in terms of floodplain mapping or um, in terms of, yeah, just thinking about these types of restoration or not restoration projects? Um, yeah. Do you have any insights from folks outside of Montana who maybe have approached this in a different way? Yeah, you know, I, I think the whole industry has changed dramatically in the last decade where we really, really are truly focusing more on process and more about 
connect. I, I used to teach the help teach the inner flu short course. It was called process based channel design. And it was about design. It was about getting that top width down to, you know, you'd see top widths that our top width's going to be 28.45 feet. And you're just like, now you'd be laughed out of the room. Now it's all about ranges and it's all about, you know, variability that I think we, we had, we, we just used to be more into the, the nuts and bolts of super detailed design. And now it's really more about allowing process to happen, making things um, deformable and having good adaptive management in place. One thing that I had in here that I took out, I know I was jumping all over the place, but you know, one other thing that we see is when you do a monitoring plan, give yourself lots of room because like when you see an event like on where you have a flood event and things wild, widen out and your monitoring plan has a tolerance levels for channel width, um, there's a good chance you can be painted into a corner where you're out maintaining a project that you feel like this is stupid. I shouldn't be here, but the monitoring plan is making me do it. So those ranges and that flexibility and basically, and also climate, right? Now we've got this big wild card of trying to accommodate this uncertainty that really is really moving us towards, I think, much more of a flexible approach to adaptive management. And you know, in the Deschutes in Oregon, those guys, they're using what they call a geomorphic grade line. They create a design profile and they've gone out and just graded the valley bottom, thrown a bunch of wood in and let water in. I mean, they don't even design a channel, let alone build one. So um, it's, it's an interesting time to not be so cocky about what we think we know and how to accommodate uncertainty and celebrate it. You know, I think a lot of it is the disturbance on the Clark Fork. That system was underwater the year after we built it and we were terrified and it turned out and Milltown Dam, they'll tell you the same thing. They just built Milltown. It was underwater in 2011 for seven weeks or something. And all of the people who built it thought this, oh man, we are, you know, this is trouble. And they go out now and they say that event was one of the most remarkable things that happened. And so, um, holding your breath and allowing process. And, and basically our job is to put the ingredients there so that natural process can take over. But then when it happens, you have to be ready for it. And it could be kind of scary. Much, much humility required. <laughs> yeah, and patience. And patience, yeah. Um, it looks like uh, Eric Trum's got his hand up and, and thanks to Eric. I don't know if everyone noticed, but um, when we were talking about um, where to find floodplain maps and things, Aaron put the DNRC stream permitting guide in the chat. So you might want to check that out if that's of interest. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, that's something a group of us um, helped put together uh, a couple of years ago to update and really, you know, shift towards that. Um, as Karen was talking about shifting towards looking at natural processes and how to use those in a way from riprap. Um, so I guess a couple of points that I wanted to mention. So I think Karen's right. There has been a shift over you know the past you know five ten years um, on understanding that erosion is is within um, within the natural context in a lot of areas. Um, and I think professionals we're we're getting that. But I think there's still that. How do you get that message out to landowners? Because I think that's what you know watershed groups and conservation districts. Those are the calls they get. My bank is eroding. How, what do I do? Um, and I guess that leads to my question. And really, it's to Jeff. This was a stream bank erosion was a topic at the water policy interim committee meeting today. And I think Jeff spoke there and just wondering, um, I don't know if he can give us some insight on what came out of that. Well, <laughs> you know, it is a study committee. So um, what comes out of it is going to be months down the road. Uh, but I, what, I, what I took from it is, is that um, we, we all recognize that we're getting more and more erosion on our water bodies, uh, primarily based on more recreational use. And we can all point fingers at the big wave boats. That's maybe the worst of it, but, but any boat with any wake at all contributes to stream bank um, erosion. So what I hope the interim committee takes away from this is, is that yes, it is a problem. 
So first of all, we, we will raise the awareness through the legislature, there's a problem. And then second of all, what, what would be the solution? And, and in my opinion, the solution, as much as I guess I'd like to see it, is not to eliminate wave boats, not to eliminate uh, or to have a, a no wake zone everywhere. I think it's a combination of some regulation uh, on the boaters themselves, but then I think a lot of it is incumbent on us as watershed and conservation district folks, resource people. We need to get the awareness out more and more and more. We've been trying for years, but to landowners along waterways, take care of your darn repairing corridor and keep that vegetation in place as best as you can. Uh, that has to be a major part of the toolbox too. But uh, I think we can get some relief uh, there are places like the Flathead River that really the, where this uh, study resolution came from. That is a tough cookie up there. Uh, the real reality on anything permanent there is is actually got to be a different regulating uh, regime on Kerr Dam, uh, a lot less fluctuation in that water, or we'll, we'll never get anything accomplished on that river. It's way too much of a fluctuation to grow anything, and it's actually too big of a river to even accomplish much with, with millions of dollars of riprap. So anyways, that's my take on it, Eric. Um, I think it was a good gathering today. Uh, some pretty good uh, uh, presentation testimony, but uh, where it's all gonna go, I don't know, but at least it's a, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Thanks for that, you too. And I just dropped, um, just talking about that landowner education piece. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I think it's mostly Lewis and Clark Conservation District and Cascade Conservation District, correct me if I'm wrong, but they've got that Living on the Bank website. If any of you haven't seen that, um, yeah, it's just a really great tool with a lot of resources for taking care of our stream banks and keeping them vegetated and, and all that. Jeff, uh, I've got a quick question. Up in, you know, in some of those areas in the Flathead where, you know, the boating is taking place through, you know, really fine sand and silty banks uh, in the delta above Flathead Lake and, you know, very low gradient stream. Uh, Karen's pretty familiar with it. Um, and uh, uh, I guess I'd like her reaction to this too. Um, you know, there is a real problem, but I'm wondering, are there examples up in that area where erosion's occurring, where they have good stands of riparian vegetation and it's holding the banks together? And if so, you know, is that something those folks should aggressively be pursuing? So Jeff, can I, I, please, I just please, I, I just throw in yeah we worked on that a while ago and Chuck the problem is they like Jeff is saying they raised the stage in the summer for recreation so during the growing season the water is really high on the lowermost flat below Kalispell in the lake and so nothing can grow and then the flows drop and so it's a it's um there's really no growing season available for those lower banks if that makes sense. You know, years ago, I worked out on the Sacramento on wave wash problems, and it's huge in the Sacramento River Delta and big boats coming through. And they were actually designing pilings to put in at the toe of the bank with with log booms that were attached with, you know, metal rings. So they would go up and down with and basically be bumpers for uh, boat wakes. And um, so they had all these all these floating logs and they were gonna carve holes and put plant, turn them into planters essentially so they could protect the banks from wave wash because it was a real problem. But yeah, I think that's one of the, what Jeff is saying about Kara Dam and the, and the stage is really tricky on the flathead. Another stressor, right? And Jeff, if, you dis if that's not the case, if I'm wrong there, chime in. That's what I remember. That's right on, right on, Karen. You know, if what what's the daily fluctuation in water level? You think, or you know, seasonal? Uh, how much variability is there in the flathead uh, based on Kerr Dam releases? 
Um, does it occasionally go, you know, up and down or fluctuate a little bit, or is there just a seasonal raising and a seasonal drawdown? Because, you know, that can affect, especially in fine sediments, which have quite a bit of capillary action, that can affect the core water pressure and lead to, you know, bank sloughing, you know, outside of any wave action. Um, so, you know, that should probably be factored in too. Blame it on per dam. Uh, Chuck, the fluctuation, don't quote me because it's been a while, but I think it's like 10 to 15 feet, maybe 20 feet. It's a lot. And you're right that the capillary action, whatever, hydrostatic pressure, whatever you want to call it, that in itself is an issue. And then you put an incredible increase in, in, in recreational boat use, including the wave boats, uh, hammering on those banks, <clears throat> you got a problem. And so <clears throat> it's one of those areas where without changing the Kerr Dam regulation, there's not a heck of a lot you're gonna be able to do. I have seen areas on that river, I'm sure you probably have Chuck Karen certainly, uh, where you've got ma uh, major stands of, of, of cottonwood, cottonwood galleries, they're literally falling into the river. I mean, there is a limit on what a repairing buffer can do when you can't replenish it with a, a reasonable growing season. That, uh, you know, the, that's the problem. What is the answer? <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah, thanks for, yeah. <laughs> thanks for everybody. I was just gonna, we've got a couple minutes left here. Um, I did what, I think we've got time for one more question, maybe from somebody who hasn't asked a question yet or, or an insight from someone who hasn't spoken up yet. All right, last chance. Okay, I have a question. Great, thanks, <laughs> Mel. Most, mostly out of curiosity. Um, wondering about like the riffle um, repair, I guess, but you, I don't know what you would call it, but how, like to what size of scale does that work on a river? Like how does the scale of the river affect what kind of, um, I don't know, construction project you would do on it? I feel like I don't quite know enough about how, like what this is to ask my question properly, but does that make sense? Karen? Yeah, no, no, it's huge. I mean, you can't go, I mean, if you go up by Townsend and go to the fishing access there, they have all the quotes from Lewis and Clark about the size of channels they saw beaver dams on. And they say they don't build dams on anything wider than 30 feet, right? There's a limit, right? And so um, that's one thing that we're really trying to push right now is because you're not going to go into a big system and build BDAs. You're not going to build a BDAs and entrenched system, but we're trying to raise flood, raise rivers back to their flood plains. We've done it on the Ruby and these are big rock ramps that are basically uh, raised grade and you want to do it in systems that have a high sediment load because you don't want it to be ponded. The fisheries Folks are not interested in, in losing those habitats, but if you have a high enough sediment load, so it'll backfill, but, but um, we're kind of pushing it on some bigger systems to try and raise these streams because on the Ruby, we're raising it like a foot and we're accessing acres and acres of wetlands and side channels. But sometimes it's a little bit like, whoa, we're going way beyond what a BDA would do. But the materials then you have to design accordingly and suddenly you're using um, sort of a larger rock core with alluvium draped on the upstream and downstream sides. And then we're going to monitor them very closely, but you know, you can model it and just see before and after the extent that you can get improved floodplain access. So that's sort of vertical reconnect reconnections of streams that are mildly entrenched, even big ones, man, you can get a lot of response and, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but yeah, always scale it, right? Um, while I'm here, I don't know if anybody else has anything, but I just wanted uh, the stream permitting guide that Eric posted, I'd put in a plug for that as well. And I know there's a lot of, you know, a lot of the rubber hits the road with the CD supervisors making decisions on 310 permits. And I'm really glad that that document exists, both, both for the practitioners and the, and the supervisors to help make decisions. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Karen. I just had a couple. I have I have two questions of all of you. I'm hoping because you know these lunchtime conservation conversations are evolving and have gotten a little bigger. And a couple of things I just like maybe you could like um, do a thumbs up or something or a thumbs up or thumbs down on this question. So I'm curious um, if so. You know, we want these recorded so that people can watch them. But I'm wondering if continuing to record during the Q and A and discussion, which I think can be fascinating in itself. Do you feel like that discouraged you from answering or from asking questions because you're being recorded? If anybody like like give us a like thumbs down if that was any issue at all because I don't want to record people who nope okay should we, so we should generally keep keep recording the discussion? Okay, I can only see four people's videos, so if any, <laughs> okay, good. Well, in the chat, thanks. And then my second question, um, which. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, my second question, equally important, um, you know, so we've been doing these monthly and I'm wondering, is there still, I know people get real busy June, June through August, even, even outside of that. Um, how many of you like would still be interested in attending these through the summer? Give me a thumbs up if you still would, would consider that or would have time to do that. Okay. And then if you couldn't, if you're like, nope, summer's out, can't do these, give me a thumbs down. Okay, well, that looks like my answer. Um, yeah, thanks to Karen and um, so much for doing this. And, and a reminder, I think Christine might still be here. Yeah, um, Christine Brissett is gonna be talking at our next lunchtime. Oh, Nikki, I um, yes, we are definitely gonna save the chat. I'll be, I'll be sending out an email to everybody with the recording, as well as all the resources that I remember and or were in the chat, that'll all go out in an email to everybody. Um, but just a reminder that on, in our next lunchtime conservation conversation, which is also going to be on a Wednesday at noon, is April 13th, and that is going to be with um, Christine Brissett, um, and it's going to be on coming up with match and leveraging funding for your grants. So a little bit of a shift, but I think a really useful topic right now, especially as all this federal funding is coming out. I know that's always a challenge is finding the match, um, and so Christine's going to kind of open up a conversation on that. Um, again, similar format, hoping you all can bring your expertise as well. Christine, did you want to say anything on that? Yeah, I would just say, I mean, I, I've been thinking about this presentation a bit, and um, I have some some ideas, and I know some of you on this call, and many of you I don't. So, you know, we'll, we'll do kind of a base overview, and I, I think I, I have some good creative examples, but um, there's no silver bullet here on on how we find and, and come up with match. And so I am, I think it could be a really fun discussion to like bring your your most creative and, and wild ways you were able to show that you put, you know, five thousand dollars on the ground um, or whatever it is. And and that could be it's those those are the kinds of examples that people can come away with and, and apply towards the project. So I'm just I mostly agreed to doing this not because I'm an expert at it, because I'm I'm curious to be part of the conversation. So yeah, please come with some ideas. Yeah, thanks, Christine. And I just dropped in the chat the link to the MWCC training page where all these lunchtime conservation conversations are housed, not just the registration for upcoming ones, but also recordings and slides and things from the previous conversations. You just have to scroll, and it says at the top, you just got to scroll down to the lunchtime conservation conversations. Look like, Alex, did you still have a question? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, yeah, that that is it for me. Just um, lots of thanks to Karen. Um, I know you put a lot of work into that presentation. It was really entertaining uh, for me. I think it was great. And, um, and also just, yeah, great conversation. Thanks to everyone who asked questions and chimed in um, and just kept this really engaging. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll be uh, making... Making more announcements in Watershed News. Keep your eyes out. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Karen. Bye-bye. Yeah.